This coach is traveling from Rio de Janeiro to Lima, around 6,000 kilometers across the South American continent. It's currently crossing the Peruvian Andes, 3,500 meters above sea level, and has just reached the so-called Curva de Muerte, the bend of death. The precipice has claimed the lives of more than 300 people. You have to be extremely attentive and cautious when you're driving at these high altitudes. For a lot of reasons, the animals, the climate, it might start to rain or even hail, so you have to pay twice as much attention. You might suddenly hit ice in a curve. One little slip like that can be fatal. The most dangerous maneuver is passing on a winding road. A travel bus crashed into the valley here. The crosses remember the many dead. In Peru, about three times as many people die on the roads as in Germany or France. The Trans Oceanica is a highway route that runs 6,300 kilometers across South America. It begins on the Atlantic coast and passes through the Amazon rainforests and the Andes Mountains, ending finally at the Pacific. The overland journey has raised high hopes. The Transoceanica will make South America seem smaller. The natural scenery is magnificent, but it's also under threat. Nothing will be growing here even a century from now. People here are frightened, but it is the others who should be afraid. No bus trip is like another. You know when you leave, but not when you'll arrive. farmland, livestock, and terraces that were originally built by the Incas. Temperatures in the mountains near the equator are still mild, even at 3,000 meters. This region was once at the heart of the Inca Empire. The Transoceanica is one of the longest highway routes in the world a bus service between Rio de Janeiro and the Peruvian capital, Lima, has just opened along the route. Lasting at least four days, it's the longest bus trip in the world. The bus is now passing through a narrow valley along the Pachachaca River. Passengers already have 5,400 kilometers behind them, and there are now just 900 kilometers to go. Time is dragging on the bus. It's full of garbage, and the smell of unwashed clothes hangs in the air. Retired policeman Jacinto Cajuana comes from Lima. He's been working in Sao Paulo for seven years to supplement his pension as a musician, night watchman, and factory worker. While I was in Brazil, my mother died, and so did the mother of my son. Both were taken sick and died. That's how life is. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there because I didn't have the money. The news took me by surprise, and the tickets were too expensive. Still, life goes on. Jacinto is going home for the first time in seven years. 
His son is now 16 years old. He was eight when he last saw him. At the end of the valley, the road climbs to the Puna Plateau, 4,200 meters above sea level. The landscape is barren. Temperatures this close to the equator change little throughout the year. 61-year-old bus driver Daniel Mancilla has been driving this stretch for 34 years. In this part of the Andes, the people are very poor. They live from agriculture and livestock farming. Llamas, alpacas, vicuñas. The animals fetch a good price at the markets. And that way, the people can earn a little more. The main sources of income are wool, milk, and meat from llamas, alpacas, and vicuñas. But the valuable animals are under threat. Zoologist Norma Bujaiko and veterinarian Marco Zuniga monitor the wild vicuña population. A parasite has decimated their numbers in the last few years. You know, the animals over there are going to die. There are a lot of skeletons back there. These vicuña are also going over there to die. The ones at the back? Yes, look over there. Oh, they certainly look like they have mange. This is a pelvic bone. I'm pretty sure the animal died of mange. You can see the traces left by the mites here. See, this is mange. It's killing the vicuñas. We need to treat these animals. This disease is a major problem. Think of how many animals have already died. Last year, we were able to contain the spread of mange. We treated about 16,000 vicuñas. But there are still animals with the disease here in the nature reserve. Those are the ones over there. They'll die on the other side of the road. We couldn't completely cure some of them. Vicuñas are a relative of the llama. Fabric made from their wool is soft and fine and an excellent insulator. These graceful animals only live here in the Andes at altitudes of between 3,800 and 4,800 meters. For the last eight years, mange has been rampant in Peru. The parasite eats through the fur of the animals, leaving them unprotected against the cold and rain. They freeze to death. In recent years, treatment using special baths proved effective and greatly reduced the number of infected animals. But now the disease is spreading again. The 22,000 vicuñas in the region are still at risk. It's transmitted through contact with domesticated animals. There are also alpaca here. They live side by side. The alpaca infect the vicuñas and vice versa. It just gets worse and worse. We've suffered enormous economic losses because of the disease. Every two years, the vicuñas are rounded up and partly shorn. Just 150 grams of wool are taken from each animal. That makes their wool the most expensive in the world. A coat made of vicuña wool can cost 7,000 euros and upwards. The mange could soon make vicuña wool even more expensive, and thousands of farmers could lose their livelihoods. The animals provide the biggest source of income in this poor region in the Andes. War and exploitation tore this region apart in the 1980s and 1990s. It was firmly in the grip of Maoist rebels, the Shining Path. They and the military took it in turns to attack and devastate the mountain villages. 70,000 people died in the conflict. 
bus driver Daniel Mancia still remembers the time well. We were often stopped by the guerrillas while we were on the road. They wanted to discuss their ideology with us, tell us what they wanted to change in Peru. They said they were fighting the corrupt authorities and police. So many innocent people were killed. And the government back then, in the 1980s, was really corrupt and divided. They just let everything go. And it went on and on until the terrorism became uncontrollable. The president at the time, Alberto Fujimori, defeated the Maoists. He came to power with the help of the military and waged a bloody war in the Andes. Later, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison for using death squads against the locals. But it's been peaceful in Lucanas province since the turn of the millennium. The mountain farmers have joined forces and formed cooperatives. This whole village lives from the Cunha wool. The women in this village cooperative clean the wool and separate the fine undercoat from the coarser outer fibers by hand. The Vicuña's coat has two layers, bristles and wool. We only remove the bristles so the wool is left. That's what we use to make cloth. Valeria Segara, the workshop manager, keeps a detailed account of who gets how much wool to clean and sort. Eight hundred forty-six grams. That's a lot. <laughs> She'll take care of it. <laughs> Every gram counts. Even the untreated wool costs the equivalent of 300 euros a kilo. Once it's been cleaned, it's worth almost twice as much. That's a lot of money to the women here, who earn the equivalent of 150 euros a month. Hello. How's it going? Are you working? What are you up to? When a vicuña dies, that means a loss of income for Lucanas. Our entire production is at stake. We used to produce 1,300 kilos of wool a year. But in the last three years, we've barely managed half of that. We've always landed between 300 and 600 kilograms. After surviving the terror of the Shining Path and the war, people here are now threatened by mange. The sorted wool is stored in a vault in Lucanas. Altogether, these bulging sacks are worth a total of around half a million euros, but they used to be twice as much wool. Norma Bujaiko and Marco Zuniga will be back in the Pampa Galeras Reserve in June to treat thousands of vicuñas in the hope of stemming the disease. Then they'll return to Lucanas on their stretch of the Transoceanica. Oh, <laughs> 
Alberto, no? Hello. Hello, sister. How's it going? Hola, hermanita. ¿Cómo está? Acá. What are you doing? I'll be passing Ica around 9 this evening. Listen, we're right in the middle of the mountains. The connection's really bad. I'll call you later. Love you. Daniel Mancia steers the bus away from the Andes towards the west. In Nazca, he turns off the Transoceanica and onto the Pan American Highway, which runs the length of both North and South America, from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego. From here, it's still 450 kilometers to Lima. The highway runs through the 1,500 kilometer long coastal desert one of the most arid regions in the world. The Nazca people carved out a civilization in this rocky desert landscape more than 2,000 years ago. They left enormous and mysterious geoglyphs etched into the desert floor. The bus route runs straight through them. In recent years, the desert sand dunes have also become a tourist attraction. Buggy driver Carlos Mila Chai is on his way to work at the extraordinary Huacachina Oasis. Limeños, as the people of Lima are called, used to come here to escape the stress of city life and take the sulfurous waters. But nowadays, the main attraction is no longer the oasis, but the desert itself. Sand buggy tours are on offer everywhere. Carlos takes out as many as 10 a day. The vehicles are homemade, with chassis and engines mostly taken from old Fords. Seats and bodywork are welded onto the frames. There are a lot of people living here, so we're conscious of the noise. That's why we've fitted the engines with a kind of muffler. They're pretty big. It means the tourists can have their peace and not hear the din of the engines in the morning. Before the buggies and plastic paddle boats, legend has it that a native tribe lived here, a young married couple among them. The wife's name was Huacai China. When her husband was killed in a war, she cried for three days and nights and created the lagoon. It's said that Huacai China still inhabits the lagoon as a mermaid. When there's a full moon, they say you can see her mourning her beloved on the banks of the lake. Local hoteliers alert their guests to listen to her cries from their balconies and terraces. Hey, 
Truth be told, the lagoon is no longer as natural as it once was. Water's channeled in over there to keep the level up. All the oases in the desert dried up between 1995 and 1997. There was a boom in agriculture at the time. Wells for irrigation were drilled all over the place, which is why the lagoon's water level fell, and it almost dried out. Sometimes you have to make sacrifices to survive. We simply have no conscience. But if the lagoon dries up, there will be no more tourists, and the animals and plants will die. This region is the center of the Peruvian agricultural sector. In the distance, avocados and asparagus are grown in plantations for the global market. Deeper and deeper wells are being drilled to provide water for the crops. As a result, the desert is slowly expanding. The bus passes the lagoon shortly after dark. Santos Cabedo is now behind the wheel. There are just 300 kilometers to go to Lima. The road runs north along the Pacific shore. Pisco is one of the numerous fishing villages along the coast. The boat crews are getting ready to go out to sea early in the morning. A grey morning dawns. The passengers have spent their last night on the road. They've now been travelling for 142 hours. The air inside the bus is thick enough to cut with a knife. The whole bus stinks of dirty clothes and unwashed bodies. The passengers are now united by three common wishes, to arrive, shower, and see their families. Jacinto hasn't seen his children for seven years. The first thing I want to do when I arrive is see my children. That's the most important thing. And my father. He's still alive, though he's already 90, and he'll soon be 91. Bus driver Daniel Mancilla has 10 days off after this trip. It's not always the case. Sometimes he has to go straight back to Rio de Janeiro. Well, I'll tell you, a long five-day journey like this is pretty exhausting. But it's also satisfying. And the passengers are also grateful because you've got them to their destinations safe and sound. Vuelvo a 
¡Ay, pasando un cacho! ¡Va pasando! The fishermen of Pisco are catching mullet right off the coast. Jimmy Hernandez, the boat owner, has his son with him. He has to help out during the school holidays. <laughs> The other boats have been out for hours and are hauling in their nets. They haven't got much to show for their time and effort. We go out in the boats to fish. We still use these nets. That's how we do it. But one day, there will be fish, and the next, there will be none. Look, those guys over there haven't caught a single fish. Maybe crabs, but there's nothing. A few small mullet, but none of the fish that are usually here. We might catch a few small mullet or squid. If I'm lucky, I'll go home with five to seven crates. This year, El Nino is behind the scarcity of the fish. The weather phenomenon pushes warm water onto the cold Peruvian coast, and the currents reduce the size of the schools of fish. Some species, such as tuna, don't enter the coastal waters at all anymore. Fishermen can usually anticipate exactly what they will catch, but in El Nino years, they can only rely on luck. Now we beat the water with a paddle. That's what he's doing. We make noise to stop the fish from swimming off. The fishermen drive their boat in a circle and bang on the water to drive their prey into their nets. It's a technique they've copied from humpback whales. The mammals create a circle of air bubbles around the schools of fish and then swim through them with their jaws open. A mullet. Look, a mullet. Why are you in such a good mood? What else should I do? Times are bad and I'm trying to stay optimistic. These are great for ceviche. The catch is meager. So meager it won't even be sold, but will instead feed the fishermen and their families. I'll never stop fishing. I've been fishing since I was a kid. I even left school for it. But that was a bad idea. When I see the consequences, I regret it. But now it's too late. No, I don't want to do this. Go out fishing every day. I want to study and become an engineer. I want him to go to university and be somebody. If he follows in my footsteps, he'll just continue to suffer. I want him to make something of himself and have a better job. After four fruitless hours, Jimmy and his crew return to port, where his brother Julio prepares ceviche, the Peruvian national dish of raw fish cured in citrus juice. Just 20 meters further on in the sorting hall, workers are trimming the catch of those fishermen who had more luck today. Skate, rays, mullet, and parrotfish. El Nino determines what the catch will be this year. Only the pelicans are completely content. They don't care which sort of fish the scraps come from. The main thing is, they don't have to catch it themselves.
Jimmy and his crew will be relieved when this difficult El Nino year is over and the fishing improves. They haven't given up hope of a good catch yet. Most of their colleagues don't even bother to put to sea. Tonight we'll go out fishing again. Maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe we'll catch some fish. Last night they were nowhere to be seen. The bus is now 200 kilometers further north, driving through the suburbs of Lima at six in the morning. After 144 hours on the road, they're nearly there. Good morning, passengers. The bus company would like to thank you for joining us on our maiden voyage from Rio de Janeiro to Lima. It is always a great pleasure to make the journey with such exceptional, sympathetic, and marvelous guests. It makes everything more pleasurable. Ladies and gentlemen, dear passengers, I wish you a pleasant day and a nice stay in our capital, Lima. Thank you very much. I loved it. I want another five days. <laughs> On this misty summer's day, Lima still seems sparing with its charms. For six months of the year, the city is shrouded in dense coastal fog, and the metropolis, with 10 million inhabitants, disappears in the haze. Mornings are the worst. The grey sky over Lima, Peruvian writer Sebastián Salazar said 50 years ago. Now, smog has added to the mist. Underneath the fog, the city looks quite different. The economic boom of recent years is reflected in the cityscape. Tourists, bright colors, markets, and new shops everywhere. there's still no central bus station. Each bus company has its own departure area. The Ormenio Transoceanica maiden voyage took exactly six days, a total of 144 hours, and a full two days more than planned. Camila, Catherine, and Suilem are three sisters who have spent their lives so far in Brazil. Because of the poor economic situation there, they're now moving to their mother's family in Lima. The delay had their aunt anxious and worried. I'm so happy. My nieces are finally here. Their mother is waiting outside. Ah, oh, at last. Student Julio Edison Lavrente's mother and aunt have come to pick him up. He's been studying in Sao Paulo for six months. Hey, he's put on weight. He's been eating too much. I had a good time. Yeah, it was great. Bus driver Daniel Mancia heads straight home to his family. His children and grandchildren are already waiting for him. The small community of passengers quickly breaks up. Addresses are exchanged, and then everyone goes their own way. The longest bus journey in the world is over. 
I don't know if they'll recognize me. It's been a long time. But I must still look a bit like me. Many thanks. Bye. Jacinto Cajuana still has 10 kilometers to go to get to the San Juan de Larigancho district. Then he can finally hug his son. Familia! Esa es. <laughs> Uncle. Wow, it's you. It's been such a long time. Dad, how are you? Have you been listening to good music? My son. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? How tall you are? Yeah, you All good? Damn, you're already a man. How old are you? Sixteen already? Yeah, he's a hard worker and has always helped me. I've always been there for him. I've never let him down. True, I'm a long way away, but in my heart he's always there with me. Now everything will get better, little by little. We always listened to music together and had fun in this house. And the whole time they kept asking, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? Well, now I'm here. We'll soon be making music again, like we always used to do when mother was still alive. But Jacinto isn't home to stay. He's just visiting. In a week, he'll be back on the bus to travel 6,000 kilometers back to Sao Paulo to earn money to send back to Lima. Otherwise, his family would be unable to get by. Daniel Mancia has also arrived home. His eldest daughter has been running the household since his wife died three years ago. He lives with his four daughters and nine grandchildren. The family home is directly on the Pan American Highway. Daniel Mancia is concerned that his grandchildren may run onto the road. His main task in the coming 10 days is to teach them not to. My parents had 11 children. Families always used to be big. Everyone had 8, 10 or 14 children. Today it's only two, no more. Well, maybe three, usually just two, preferably a girl and a boy. <laughs> Grandfather and father Daniel is the family's primary breadwinner. Bus drivers like him earn between 500 and 700 euros a month, a middle class income in Peru. His pride and joy is a small field with a few old mango trees. Uh, it's really important to come home. I can see my family. I can see that they're healthy. I can see how happy they are when they see me, when they greet and embrace me. That makes me twice as happy, and it gives me strength. And when the time comes to get back on the road, 
I can do that without worrying. Because I know that when I get back, my family will be waiting for me. They'll have smiles on their faces. They'll be delighted. That makes me happy, and it fills me with life. Their joy is my life. I'm happy, very happy. This is our harvest. Oh, I'm sweating. <laughs> In just a few days, Daniel Mancia will once again set off on the world's longest bus journey, back to Rio de Janeiro. And add another 6,300 kilometers to the 8 million he's already driven so far. <laughs>